In this video, we're going to continue our discussion on nomenclature, and we're going to talk today about how to name acids and bases. Acids and bases are types of ionic compounds with specific characteristics, and they are distinct enough from ionic compounds that they actually get their own set of naming rules. Let's talk about some of the learning objectives for this particular video. We'll start by identifying what acids and bases are. We'll talk about the process of identifying a chemical compound as being an acid or a base. This is so that you know how when to use the acid and base rules. We'll talk about the rules then for naming acids. We'll then talk about the rules for naming bases. And just as a quick preview, naming bases is actually very similar. It's going to follow the same exact rules we talked about with uh, ionic compounds. Finally, once we got those names underway, we'll go over some practice problems. Let's begin by discussing what an acid actually is. Uh, it can be defined in a lot of different ways, uh, but basically speaking, it is a corrosive substance, meaning it burns things, that reacts vigorously with other chemicals, especially things like bases and metals. Most notably, it has a pH below 7. Uh, pH is a measurement of the concentration of H plus ions. The higher that concentration, the lower the number is. Uh, so pH below 7 means we're dealing with an acid as our substance. We continue this process of defining what an acid is. A lot of scientists have defined them in a different way. Uh, for example, any liquid or substance that increases the concentration of S H plus ions is something that's known as an acid, as defined by a scientist by the name of the Arrhenius. This is what's the definition of an Arrhenius acid. Likewise, other scientists have defined it in different ways depending on how their research worked. For example, Bronsted and Lowry defined an acid as being something that donates protons to a solution. If you think about what a proton is, it's basically the same thing as a hydrogen plus one ion. These definitions are obviously very similar, but they have subtle differences when you're using these in actual action. Uh, finally, again, as we mentioned before, uh, acid can be defined as any type of liquid that lowers the pH of your solution by the addition of that acid. Any of these work just fine. We'll have a chapter at the end of the year this year uh, that allow us to explore this concept of acids a little bit more, uh, but I just wanted to kind of provide you with some definitions. What you need to be most aware of the fact is an acid is an ionic compound with H plus ions as the positive ion, and this is the key here. This is how you're going to spot something as being an acid. When you see that ionic substance and you've got an H out front of it, you're dealing with something that is an acid and you're going to want to use the acid rules that we're about to talk about. Moving on, the next question then is what is a base? And you're going to find that the definition for a base is very similar to that of an acid. Again, a base is a corrosive substance that reacts vigorously with other materials, especially acids and in this case organic matter. Bases are very dangerous to uh, things like skin and tissue. Uh, and again, it can be characterized as something with a pH that is greater than 7. Uh, bases tend to be the opposite of atoms or acids, so when adding an acid lowers the pH, adding a base raises the pH. Just like before, we can talk about this based on a couple different scientists. Uh, according to Arrhenius, an acid is something that decreases the H plus ion concentration. The OHs from the uh, base cancel out the H's from the acid. Uh, an acid can all, or base can also be described by Bronson and Lowry as being a proton acceptor. It, it takes away the H plus ions, and again, it's something that raises the pH of a solution. This is things we'll talk about again later in the year. What you want to be aware of right now is that a base is an ionic compound with the OH negative one ion as the negative ion. If you see that OH at the end, you know that you are dealing with a base in this scenario. Let's now talk about some of the naming rules themselves. Uh, just like before, we'll use this in the first name, last name kind of scenario. Uh, but unlike before, acids actually don't have a first name associated with them. If you recall, an acid always has H plus as its positive ion. Therefore, the name does not require us to include that. By naming it as an acid, we'll automatically know it has an H plus. Therefore, all the rules we're dealing with today deal with the rule, just what's going on with the last name. And there's a couple things going on here. Uh, first of all, when you're dealing with that last name, you just got to look up the name of your negative ion. That's what our last name always associated with, what the negative ion is. Now, depending on the scenario, we're going to treat this a couple different ways. If that negative ion is monoatomic, it's made of only one type of ion. We're going to change the ending to ick. We're going to add the prefix hydro. And then finally, we're going to add in uh, the word acid 
to the end. And we'll go over some examples of how this works a little bit later on. So if it's a monoatomic ion, we change the ending to ic, we add the prefix hydro, and then we add the word acid to end. If your ion is polyatomic, we're going to do a couple of different things. Uh, first of all, we're going to um, no prefix. As you'll see in our examples, the way we tell the difference between the monoatomic acid and the polyatomic acid is the presence of the prefix. And depending on what it is, we're going to add different endings. If your polyatomic ends in an A-T-E ending, you're going to change that ending to ic. If it ends in an I-T-E ending, you're going to change that ending to us, O-U-S. So A-T-E endings change to ic, I-T endings change to us. And then finally, just like before, we're going to add the word acid to the end. And that's going to be our set of rules for naming acids. And it basically breaks it down whether it's a monoatomic or a polyatomic ion making up that negatively charged ion. When naming bases, the great news is, is that we have no new rules to talk about. When you name bases, it's the same exact rules we use for naming ionic compounds. The only catch is going to be your negative ion is always going to be that OH ion with the charge of negative 1. And that's exactly what we're talking about down here. So this one, unlike the acids, is super duper nice and easy. It's simply a matter of using the ionic rules that you've hopefully already learned about. Now let's put this all into practice. Uh, at this stage in the game, I think you might be ready to give these a try. Um, I'm going to ask you to pause the video for a few minutes, give the problems a whirl. If you have trouble with them, unpause the video. I'll go over the answers in a couple seconds. So here are the answers we're looking for. Uh, let's go through these one at a time. HCl, again, the name has nothing to do with the H. We're worried about what the negative ion is. Cl is a monoatomic ion. If you go back to our sheet, uh, we talked about the fact that we would add in a prefix hydro, we would add in the ending ic, and then the chloro comes from the name of that ion, which is the element chlorine. And then finally, we tag the word acid on the end to end up with the substance hydrochloric acid. Now, just through contrast, let's take a look at the answer here. Again, we're not interested in the H. That's not part of the name. The name only bases itself on the negative ion. In this case, it's ClO3. This guy is polyatomic, and polyatomic meant a couple different things. First of all, no prefix out front. Chlor uh, ClO3 is the substance chlorate, and we said that the chlorate ending changes to ic, just like before, so we end up with the name chloric, and then just like before, we tag the word acid onto the end. Let's take it a step further. Again, we are not interested in what's going on with the H here. We're only interested in the negative ion. In this case, it's SO4. This is polyatomic ion known as sulfate. Uh, it has an ATE ending, which changes to IC. And then again, we tag the word acid onto the end. And notice again, no prefix. This is polyatomic. We only use prefixes when our ion is monoatomic. Last but not least, we have HF down at the bottom here, one of the deadliest acids that exists. You can get in a lot of trouble with this particular substance. We're not interested in the H. That leaves just the fluorine behind. Uh, it is monoatomic, made of just one atom. So we add the prefix in hydro. Fluoro or fluorine becomes fluoric. And then finally, again, we tag the word acid on the end. Here's another set of practice problems. If you had to walk through the last set together with me, uh, this is an opportunity for you to try these on your own. Uh, again, pause the video, give these a whirl, use the rules we've already written down, and see if you can't come up with names for these four compounds. We'll go over the answers together in a moment. Here are our answers, and again, let's go through how all of these work. We start over here with the substance H2S. Just like we've said over and over again, we're not interested in the H. We're just interested in the anion here, the negative ion. It's the element sulfur, meaning it's monoatomic. That means we need the prefix hydro. The ending changes to ic, and we add the word acid onto the end. We get hydrosulfuric acid. Let's take another look down here. H2SO4, again, not interested in what's going on with the H. We're focusing on what's happening here. SO4 is clearly polyatomic, which means we look it up. Its name, as we mentioned earlier, is sulfate. 
the ATE ending changes to an IC ending and we tag the word acid onto the end. This is sulfuric acid as opposed to up here where it was hydrosulfuric acid. The hydro again suggests we're dealing with the element sulfur. The lack of hydro suggests we're dealing with some sort of polyatomic ion. Let's try another one. Uh, again, we get rid of the H here. We focus on what's happening over here. This is not sulfate anymore. Notice this is SO3. This is sulfite. Uh, it has an ITE ending, which means the ending now changes in our name to OUS. This becomes sulfurous, and again, we tag on the word acid to the end. Last but not least, we have a problem that seems complicated, but in actuality, it's the same thing over and over again. We cross out our H here, and we focus on the negative ion. That negative ion is polyatomic. Um, the polyatomic ion is actually known as hypochlorite. You don't need to know that. That is something you would definitely look up. The ITE ending changes to an OUS ending, and this ends up becoming hypochlorous acid. Notice it looks like it has a prefix here, hydro, but in this case, it's a different prefix. It's hypo, and it has to do with what the polyatomic ion is, not the actual structure of the acid itself. So this is a totally legit name. Hypochlorous acid is what we're looking for. Just like with all naming systems, naming acids requires a significant amount of practice. Your job right now is to seek out practice problems either from my website or through other menu venues uh, and make sure that you practice enough of these until this system starts to become second nature. As you get more comfortable with all four naming systems, you should also be looking for mixed naming problems where all the different types of naming rules are jumbled together. You'll have an acid problem next to an ionic problem next to a covalent problem. And that's the ultimate test to see if you really understand this material and you're ready for a quiz on how to name chemical compounds.